everyone. We're going to get started today. Um, my name is Kate Kaiser, and I'm the policy director of Win Without War. And I'm so grateful not only to have you all here today um, and for your avid activism to end the war in Yemen, um, but also to be here with our distinguished um, group of speakers today who are going to share their personal views on what's happening on the ground and where we might go from here. So as folks are coming in, I welcome you to get settled and get what you need to stay present throughout the call, because um, you definitely don't want to miss what these speakers have to say. Um, I want to acknowledge um, before we begin that One Without War is an organization with supporters in every corner of the planet, um, but our home office is in Washington, D.C., which is also the unceded land of the indigenous Piscataway and Anacostan people. As we get started today, we are reminded how U.S. militarism killed and harmed indigenous and other communities around the globe and continues to do so to this day. I also wanted to just note before we begin um, that the speakers who are with us today are speaking in their personal capacity and are with us to share their personal views and experience from working in Yemen and what they hope to see in the future. Um, after our discussion and Q&A with you all and the speakers, um, we'll then move on to talk about how Win Without War wants you to take action to support peace and justice in Yemen. We'll also be dropping in links um, to different Yemeni-led organizations doing great work on the ground in Yemen to provide direct relief to people who need it most, um, because we got tons of questions from the audience uh, about where where they can donate to help and other things they can do to support folks who are working for change on the ground. Um, so with that, uh, to we'll get started. Um, this will be about an hour. Um, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A and definitely be sure to stick around with us at the end. Um, but I want to give some kind of opening framing and context of where we are today, um, because this has been a war that has been ongoing for a long time and has deep roots um, in previous, uh, not only US policy decisions, but um, events in Yemen and its history. Today marks the eve of the launch of the military intervention into Yemen's civil war by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Today, we're going to be talking about what's next for US policy in Yemen and what it should be doing if Joe Biden truly wants the US to become a credible actor for peace. As many folks here know, for six years, the US has fueled and enabled this military campaign that has severely exacerbated Yemen's humanitarian crisis and led to countless incidents of apparent war crimes. By providing refueling, weapons, and other military support, the US is actively complicit in Yemen's destruction. And after ne nearly seven years of conflict, the crisis has left 20 million people severely food insecure and decimated the country's vital civilian infrastructure. The way the conflict has been waged over the last seven years and the amount of weapons supplied by the international community has only served to prolong the war and human suffering in the conflict, while also empowering hardliners throughout Yemen to think that they can only win on the battlefield. Today, we bring together some of the leading Yemeni policy advocates with activists in the US who spent their last six years organizing for an end to the US military role in this conflict. In February, as some people may know, President Joe Biden took early action to end US material support for the so-called offensive operations in Yemen. That was a long overdue step that when without war activists, many of whom are here today, have been demanding. Um, he also appointed a US special envoy, resumed humanitarian assistance to the country, and removed um, some of Trump's last minute harmful terror designations that were impediments to peace. These are all laudable moves, but they also represent the bare minimum that the US should be doing if it actually wants to be try to become a positive force for peace. And what are those additional steps that the US should be taking? What can activists do to support these change makers? That's exactly what we're going to hear about from our speakers today. And then we'll spend some time answering questions from the audience. Um, we've already received a bunch of questions from activists who registered for this webinar. Um, but I also encourage you that as folks are um, giving remarks and talking about their experiences, you can also use the Q&A feature to drop in questions um, so we can get them answered at, uh, during the Q&A session. So with that, um, I'd like to begin by introducing our first speaker, uh, Samal Hamdani. 
Samo is the founder of the Yemenati blog that from 2011 to 2015 was a critical resource on what was happening on the ground during Yemen's popular pro-democracy revolution. I'd love to ask you, Sama, to paint a picture of what Yemen was like before the war and where it is today. And what are the key next steps that the US can take um, to bring help bring peace to Yemen? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kate, for the introduction. I would like to begin by just uh, adding a little bit more to what you said. Uh, I would like to point out that the views expressed by the organization and by other speakers do not necessarily reflect my own. However, we all do share uh, a deep commitment to peace for Yemen. Uh, I think in regards to your question, Yemen has gone through so many phases. In order for the revolution to have occurred in 2011, there's a lot of um, building tension and uh, just general dissatisfaction with the state of how Yemen was at that time. But from 2011 to 2015, we saw a transitional experience that was kind of, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, moderated by the GCC and the, the mechanism of implementation was in a sense supervised by the UN. However, it was a time of great hope for a lot of people in Yemen. Um, and that time and that hope is actually you know, when you compare it to the war that we have today, it's, it's quite dismaying because, you know, just, just on two very basic comparisons, um, Yemen before the war had women in government and, and uh, today, for example, we don't have any women in government. Uh, women before the, Yemen before the war, we had civil society organizations that were organized in networks and it and they could have done so much for the community, but today a lot of civil society organizations are actually aid delivery organizations. And I can't believe that it's been seven years of war where we've been talking about the necessity for peace in Yemen and the possible devastation that it could cause for Yemenis. And everything in a sense that we had warned for occurred. Um, it's almost like realizing your worst nightmare. And so for many Yemenis, what the war meant is, you know, for the lucky ones, it's migration forced migration, obviously leaving their homes. And for the unlucky ones, it was internal displacement, fear, terror, disease, death. Um, it was just a series of unfortunate things. And what we've seen in Yemen is the return of many illnesses. You know, the world today is preoccupied with COVID-19. Everybody's trying to race to see where they can get a vaccine. How can they mitigate the situation? But for Yemenis, it's not just COVID-19. COVID-19 is the least of their concerns as they have to battle dengue fever and malaria outbreaks and many other diseases that resurface there. Um, a lot of times during this conflict, I would sit and contemplate, can violence stop violence? I mean, in a sense, this war erupted in Yemen because on the premise that this was uh, the only way to prevent further expansion of uh, an Iranian-backed militia in the region. Seven years later, what we see is that violence did not stop the potential violence of that conflict. In fact, the Houthis today are stronger than when the war started. Um, and that's very, you know, I, I'm guessing, you know, this is not what they had wanted the war to do, but that was the predictable outcome of using force. What is Yemen's war? Yemen's war is not just um, the dropping of, of bombs and missiles, you know, obviously it's an aerial warfare. It is an asymmetric warfare. We have on the ground, uh, you know, militias fighting each other. We have the government of Yemen fighting many other sides, sometimes allied with them at other times uh, opposing them. We have guerrilla style warfare. We have an economic warfare that is very separate from the armed conflict that's taken place. We also have um, sectarian propaganda warfare that is going to continue to, to take place and evolve as, as uh, other processes are taking place. I think when I look at just war theory, really, did this war prevent the loss of innocent lives in Yemen? No. Did it harm Yemenis? Yes. I, I can speak to you from my experience with the Yemen Cultural Institute that there are many young Yemenis with so many talents who cannot hope or, or, or dare dream because they think that their reality is containing them. 
Uh, they cannot pursue what they want to pursue because the reality of war is that the only thing to do is contribute to war. You can only find careers in, in things that add to more violence in Yemen. And obviously the one thing I forgot to mention about this war is that it's not a proportionate war and the people who are paying the price are hardly mentioned. A lot of times when we talk about the conflict in Yemen, we talk as if the Yemenis are divided right down the middle between the Houthis and the government of Yemen, when in reality, the majority of Yemenis couldn't care about the Houthis or the government of Yemen because they're so distressed from the suffering of the war that all they want is for the war to stop. The majority of Yemenis are not as political as what appears on social media because very few Yemenis actually have access to internet. It's actually the voices abroad that sometimes contribute to the, to the sound of this war mongering that really needs to stop. The war that we have in Yemen today is what I would consider uh, a perpetual war. We're in a state of a perpetual war and the US already has that style of war in Yemen in their program on counterterrorism. But now you add the slayer, um, a, a devastating conflict. Um, when talking about Yemen, I also wanna point out to the listeners that Yemen is the only democracy in the Arabian Peninsula. And it is the only country that is suffering the consequences of this war. And I think the necessity to go back to peace is to realign that process and to allow for that country to see uh, the development that they need to see, to see the future that they have dreamt of. Um, so again, I think when looking at the war for me today, you know, a lot of people would argue you don't want to enter into a peace process with a militia because they're they're in a strong position today. They are actually trying to enter into Madhav. But then look at the consequence of that. If you don't enter into a peace deal today, they may enter into Madhav and they may push forward and the war would be endless. Um, there has been no proof in Yemen's experience of war that using armed conflict is actually going to uh, contain it or prevent further atrocities from happening. I think today we need to look at just war theory and to really assess, is this current war protecting innocent human life? Is it uh, protecting, um, you know, is it really defending one side over the other in a just way? And I would say that, no, that's, that's not the case. You've entered a state where it's a stalemate and it's just causing more and more devastation. I think what the Biden administration is a very powerful and strong start compared to what we saw during the Trump uh, regime. However, I do want to point out that this war started under President Obama's uh, time, and it's really refreshing to see the Biden administration take a different turn. I'm really uh, happy to see not only the return to diplomacy, but the appointment of a U.S. envoy to Yemen, Mr. Tim Linder King. I think him being appointed under the White House shows the seriousness uh, that the U.S. is willing to take now moving forward. However, how do we assess what the Biden administration is doing and how do we know that it's going in the right direction? I think we need to see that there is a just cause for ending the war. And I think that the Biden administration identified the humanitarian disaster in Yemen as a very important reason to end the conflict. Um, I couldn't agree more. I think that the next step would be to have the right intention in ending the conflict. What I mean by that is does the US want to end the conflict just to stop being involved in the conflict or to protect its allies in the region? Or is it really truly interested in the well being of 30 million Yemenis who desperately need a just participant, uh, a, a just solution to what just happened? And I think that Yemenis need the latter here, where it's really important to have a just uh, intention and a right intention to end the conflict in the right way. And I think that the third thing that the Biden administration did is the public declaration, the intention that this war must end. So right now we're in a phase where we're seeing these processes evolve and develop. I would say personally from experience that if the Saudi led coalition, which has made an announcement recently that they want the war in Yemen to end and the US if, if they both feel ready to have the war end in Yemen, then I truly believe if the right commitment is there that they are very capable of achieving it quickly and justly. Um, but at this point, I think I can't measure the right intention, but it is our job and the job of other activists who really care about human life, about ethics, 
about morality to make sure that whatever the Biden administration does has to take into consideration the well-being of millions of Yemenis. And I think I'll end with that. Thank you so much, Sama. I think that gives us such a great foundation as we begin to the discussion and also speaks to the importance of activists in the US continuing to push our own government um, to make a clean break from the past and invest deeply in justice and diplomacy as you were talking about. Um, I'd like to now turn to our next um, speaker, Abdul Wasa. Elsa Kotri. Abdul Wasa is the policy and advocacy lead for Yemen Oxfam and we and is coming to us from Sana and we're so grateful um, that you're able to be here despite some time change issues because of daylight savings time. So great to have you and look forward to hearing your remarks. Um, the question I want to ask you, Abdul Wasa, is you know, you work on the front lines of the humanitarian crisis that Sama was giving an overview of with the UN warning that Yemen could become the largest famine in decades, what do you see as the key steps needed to elevate and address the suffering of civilians in the short term and pave the way towards an end to the conflict in the long run? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kate. Uh, it, it is a, a pleasure to be here uh, with you and I really appreciate all of you for making time today uh, to discuss and highlight the crisis in Yemen. Uh, I just wanted to highlight first that uh, Yemen was already one of the uh, or, or the poorest country in the, in the region before this uh, uh, conflict started uh, six years ago. But uh, the during uh, or uh, the six years of conflict has pushed the the country further to the uh, brink of of collapse. Uh, the war has uh, destroyed public infrastructure, uh, disrupted livelihoods and and public services. And uh, this has placed, you know, millions of, across the country at extreme levels of uh, vulnerability. Uh, it is uh, uh, very sad that it always in, in the midst of, of conflicts, the civilians bear the, the most uh, of, of the impacts. Uh, well, Yemen now it, it is or it, it has been uh, the, the, the world's worst humanitarian crisis, uh, simply because over 20 million people uh, Two, th two thirds of the of the uh, population need uh, assistance to survive on on daily basis, and the fighting has been you know has has forced uh, over four million to flee their homes over the past six years. Now these people are living in in poor conditions, uh, in condensed settlements and makeshift uh, homes, uh, uh, with limited access to basic services including uh, health and uh, uh, education and and water uh, as well. Uh, these people now are at are at a greater risk of diseases. You know, many have been uh, many have been displaced more than once. Uh, also, uh, uh, it is easy to say that uh, uh, no one is safe anymore in, in Yemen. Even uh, uh, even you know IDPs, uh, not only airstrikes, uh, indiscriminate shelling, uh, or crossfire that kills people now in Yemen, but also diseases, malnutrition, you know, hunger. Uh, and starvation, you know, living conditions have uh, did, have deteriorated uh, to unimaginable uh, uh, levels as uh, parties to the conflict uh, uh, weaponize vital sectors like the economy, imposing uh, blockades and uh, dividing institutions uh, to serve their agendas with, with no regard uh, to consequences for civilians. Uh, millions of whom, you know, do, uh, do not know what to, what to eat the next day. Uh, I'm sure that statistics do not do uh, uh, do, no, do, do, not, do not do justice for the situation, but uh, there are, here are a few uh, that maybe you know may help paint a picture to the severity of the, of the crisis. And now we, we have 7.4 million people in Yemen who are in need of, of nutrition assistance, uh, critical for their survival, and uh, this also includes. 2.8, you know, close to 3 million people, uh, 3 million children, and uh, 1.7 million uh, pregnant or, or breastfeeding women uh, who will require uh, treatment for acute malnutrition. Uh, uh, also, the, the UN estimates 2.3 million children to suffer from acute nutrition, uh, of whom 400,000. Uh, could die, you know, if, if not provided uh, treatment. Uh, simply, you know, this uh, the, this crisis is, is is because the the economy has been shattered. You know, food prices have risen, 
uh, have uh, uh, risen to almost double the, the, the pre-crisis levels. And many people have uh, lost their jobs and, and cannot afford to buy enough food. Uh, for the six past years now, past six years now, Yemenis uh, have endured multiple crises while the international economy is, is watching, sadly. More uh, importantly, uh, instead of investing, you know, in ending the, the conflict, uh, some we have seen some countries, you know, including the, the United States over the previous two uh, uh, the administrations committed to the suffering of millions of Yemenis through uh, fueling and supporting either parties to uh, this conflict. Uh, the, uh, the recent, the, the recent uh, uh, shift, you know, in, in the U.S. Uh, uh, policy and its decision to put it, uh, to put it at the top of the, the diplomatic agenda has uh, sort of you know, restored hopes for an end to the devastating conflict. Uh, of course, the, over the past years now, uh, people have been you know, exhausted and uh, uh, this exhaustion is in, in the most uh, unimaginable ways. Uh, but there are certain steps that need uh, to be taken to help, you know, uh, to help uh, elevate the, the suffering. I think the most important uh, thing is, uh, you know, uh, first all parties, you know, to this conflict must be uh, pushed to immediately implement a nationwide ceasefire. Uh, uh, this uh, is, uh, uh, as you know, we have been seeing a lot of uh, escalation in fighting, uh, very intensifying fight fighting, uh, especially as uh, 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 the, the panelist has mentioned uh, uh, around Marib, which is home to over a million uh, IDPs living in settlement. Uh, already, uh, uh, since you know, since the start of, of February, or we have seen 11,000 people who were uh, forced to uh, uh, further displace due to fighting, which is ongoing uh, over the past uh, couple of months. Uh, we have seen also escalations in other in other areas, including in in Taiz, uh, Hajja, and and Hudayda, and and this is prompting further displacement of people who are already struggling, you know, to uh, survive on a daily basis. Uh, the second thing uh, is, I think it is uh, essential that the U.S. continues uh, uh, funding the, the humanitarian assistance in, in Yemen and also advocates with, with other members, uh, state members, to, to do the same. Uh, Yemen is, is uh, the worst humanitarian crisis with, with uh, uh, over 50% of the families in Yemen now, they, they have seen their livelihoods disrupted. Uh, I have already mentioned that uh, there are 20 million who are unable to survive without humanitarian aid. Uh, and uh, more worryingly, you know, uh, the, the health system is, is on, the, on the brink of collapse with only half of the country's uh, health facilities barely, uh, barely functional. I mean, shortages in, in equipment, medicines, uh, treatment, uh, uh, and uh, scarce testing laboratories, you know, in, in addition to holding also the highest food, uh, food insecurity rate, uh, uh, you know, Yemen has the highest uh, uh, food insecurity globally. And over half the population, you know, lack access to basic uh, health care services, uh, safe water and sanitation services as well, which, uh, you know, means they are at extreme vulnerability to the, the deadly COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, some may, may argue, you know, it, it is not a durable solution, you know, humanitarian appeals and all that, but it is a lifeline uh, for now for, for, for millions in Yemen. Uh, the U.S., I think, has also uh, to, to support full access of key accommodities and supplies across the country. This, is, this includes, you know, pushing, pushing the, the, the conflicting parties to remove all the restrictions uh, on imports and uh, allow the, the reopening of, of Sana'a International Airport to uh, commercial traffic uh, in and outside the country as, as well, and also pressuring all of the parties to stop uh, politicizing and uh, profiting of uh, fuel markets, uh, competing over these uh, revenues. Uh, Yemen is highly dependable on imports. Uh, the Yemen imports over 90% of its uh, food supplies uh, and, and also uh, it, it imports uh, uh, fuel supplies. Uh, now, over the, the past six years, where we have uh, seen imports through the, the port uh, shrinking at uh, 47%. And uh, also this, you know, places millions of, of people in the North, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, it forces them to face multiple fuel crises, uh, the last of which, you know, has been effective since uh, uh, last, uh, you know, June of, of last year. 
uh, and uh, you know fuel is, is essential uh, for, for the functionality of life-saving services across the country, uh, including health facilities. And this is very uh, alarming as we already seeing now a growing pattern of the deadly COVID-19 pan uh, pandemic. Uh, uh, I think also the US uh, should uh, push you know, the, the parties to adhere to the uh, international humanitarian law. Uh, parties to this conflict, you know, have shown uh, little regard to impacts on civilians over over the past six years now, uh, uh, and uh, you know, people have been suffering as a result to their actions. Uh, these include the concerning casualties and also the the, the, the amount of the displacements and also the blockades that are happening on 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 supplies like food, medicine, and uh, and fuel as well. Uh, and I think uh, the other, the, the, the one of the important things that the U.S. Uh, should also push for is, uh, uh, you know, for the economic, for, for the reform or, or the relief of the economic uh, collapse uh, from which, you know, much of the suffering of Yemenis uh, is, is coming uh, through. Uh, I think it is important for, for the U.S. administration to uh, encourage the, the uh, Yemeni parties and regional powers as well uh, to agree on sustainable solutions uh, to fix uh, the, the, the broken economy. Uh, and, you know, in the short term, for example, the U.S. Uh, uh, should push on, on, on parties, you know, to, to uh, stop weaponizing economic institutions like the central bank and, and find creative solutions, you know, to uh, depoliticize those institutions more significant. Uh, uh, I, I think a significant thing of this is paying civil uh, servants salaries, you know, which have many, many, mil you know, millions across the country have, have not been uh, seeing their salaries uh, being paid. Uh, you know, services need to, to uh, keep functioning in, in, in Yemen and without economy, this is quite impossible. Uh, I, uh, I know that, uh, I mean, across the, the country, many communities have reduced much uh, how much they eat just in order to, uh, to, to give more food to their uh, children. And uh, I think the most important thing is that the, the U.S. Uh, should uh, continue to, you know, to and, and also maintain and open and active uh, communication with, with uh, conflicting parties and also their bakers and encourage them you know, to make uh, uh, concessions for peace and also the, in, in the interim uh, to respect the, uh, uh, the independence and impartiality of humanitarian organizations as well. Uh, this is all from my side and uh, yeah, thank you again and uh, looking forward to questions from, from your uh, activists. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Abdulissa. Um, I really appreciate it. It's it's such an important um, conversation just in terms of peeling back all of the different layers and overlapping crises that are driving um, the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. Um, and I know many folks really care about um, the humanitarian crisis. And one of the reasons that our activists have been so eager to take war to change US policy is the, the complicity of our government. Um, in that suffering. So thank you so much for your work and for being here. Um, for our final speaker, before we turn to Q&A, um, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Shireen Aladini. Uh, she is the assistant professor at Michigan State University, and she's one of the most prominent activists in the Yemeni diaspora here in the States, um, demanding that the US government, under multiple presidents, end its destructive involvement and support for the coalition's disastrous intervention. Um, you know, Shireen, as uh, as Abdul Asal was talking, it's, it became clear that, you know, um, you know, there's guilt on all sides um, and all parties to this conflict have um, committed violations of international law and human rights. And something historically, as I'm sure you know, um, is that the U.S. government has had to avoid um, tangible accountability in Yemen, whether that's for the U.S. drone war, um, it's, uh, you know, aiding and abetting of war crimes by its partners um, in Saudi Arabia and the UAE, um, or it's literal fueling of this conflict by pouring so many weapons and assistance and other um, resources into this uh, internationalized civil war. So I'd love to ask you what you think the importance of accountability is for future peace in Yemen, and what do you see as the first key steps the U.S. should be taking if it's serious about becoming a positive force for peace and accountability. Thank you so much, Kate, and Win Without War for hosting this. And um, thank you to the previous speakers, Sema and Abdul Wasa, for 
sharing your insights. Um, I mean, it's really, Abdul Wasiya kind of pointed out the, the civilian impact of this, and it's really difficult to have these conversations in a way that doesn't, you know, really center civilians here. Really, this is what we, why we do all of the work that we're doing. Um, so many millions of people, and all of us are Yemeni origin. Um, you know, there's a stake in this for us. It's, it's our home, it's our families, it's 30 million civilians who continue to suffer and bear the brunt of this war. Uh, but here I am in the United States and a U.S. citizen, and so my responsibility has been over the last few years to think about the U.S. government's action. There is a, there was a civil war going on. You just sat, said that it was a, an internationalized civil war. That's an interesting term, I think, uh, because how do we continue to, to talk about civil um, wars when there are so many international actors involved? Um, and I think it's important so to recognize that over the last six years, the U.S. has been intricately intertwined with the Saudi-led coalition. The U.S. is part of the Saudi-led coalition, despite what the Wikipedia page might say or what um, the U.S. Uh, agrees to or denies. And so I think all of those crimes that we are going to detail and, and that are well documented that have been committed by the Saudis in the UAE or have also been committed by the United States under now three presidents. Um, without U.S. involvement and complicity, it's difficult really for me to imagine that the Saudis and Emiratis would have been able to wage a war this destructive for this long. And just to detail specifics here of the level of US involvement, 73% of Saudis arms imports are from the United States. Um, Saudi and Emirati pilots and soldiers are trained by the US Army and the US Air Force. Um, their targeting is informed by US commanders in the command room. Their vehicles and aircrafts, whether they were purchased from the US or not, are serviced by the US Army. In the first half of the war, their jets that were bombing people mid-air were fueled by the US Air Force. And let's not also forget the intelligence sharing, um, the cover provided at the UN, the logistical support, and importantly, support for the naval blockade that's currently starving one Yemeni child every 75 seconds. And so I think this, this is the third administration then that um, is fueling this war, is actively involved in this war despite um, recent promises, and I think there have been positive steps taken by the Biden administration, Kate, like you mentioned earlier, um, the war is still ongoing, um, the bombs are still dropping, and um, with, you, with U.S. support, even if that support looks a little different now. Um, and the blockading is still ongoing, of course, and as you've seen in the recent um, CNN investigation, this is a U.S.-backed blockade of Yemen as well. So I think for peace to eventually be uh, establish, and of course we understand um, that there's going to be a long road to peace here. It's not going to immediately happen, even if the U.S. withdraws. Uh, but the U.S. should be focused on its own complicity and its own actions. We don't have control over what happens in Yemen. Um, you know, someone kind of mentioned this idea of like violence stopping violence, and look at what we've said, we've, what we've seen. It hasn't succeeded, and so we can focus here on ending all forms of support for this war without rebranding it as a defensive war instead of an offensive, which is what I fear the Biden administration may be signaling right now. Um, you know, the U.S. needs to stop all weapon sales, not just relevant weapon sales like Biden mentioned. Um, he did stop intelligence sharing, but the U.S. continues to support this war in many ways. And essentially, we can't put out this fire when arsonists are still at work. And, um, you know, if I want to extend that a little bit, we also can't expect those arsonists to turn around and pretend to be firefighters. And I think that's the most important point here. You know, how could the US talk about peace in Yemen when it is still actively engaged in the bombing of civilians and the starving of Yemeni civilians? Um, you know, the stopping of those actions is the very least we can think about first. Um, you know, the US has participated in the killing of untold Yemeni civilians over the last six years, six years. And so the best it could do right now, the least we could hope for, is for the US to first and foremost end its own involvement and then pressure its allies as well, um, whether it's the Saudis, the Emiratis, the French, the British, and everybody else who's been fueling and participating in this war and, and profiting from this war over the last six years to stop bombing and blockading Yemen. Um, you know, this, this talk is about justice in Yemen, and you asked about accountability, and I think if this were a just world, then um, there should be accountability for war crimes committed in Yemen by all parties involved, including the United States. Um, I don't think we live in a just world, unfortunately, and I think in the absence of that, the, you know, the best we could hope for right now is an immediate end to the bombing and blockading. Um, and I really think that Congress should be overseeing this process. Um, Congress should be stepping in here to legislate an end to this war, um, as they've attempted to do under, under Trump administration with the passing of the War Powers Act, and to not rely on the promises of, 
you know, the executive branch here, you know, 30 million Yemeni lives are at stake. And so Congress shouldn't leave this up to Biden, um, who, as you know, and we've mentioned, is, was part of the administration that thought it was a great idea to start this in the first place. Um, and so what I'm essentially saying is that the U.S. should stop its own hostilities in Yemen first. Uh, it can engage in diplomatic efforts with its own allies to end their own destructive role. Um, we need to be th rethinking the UNHCR resolution that inadvertently, you know, provided um, justification for the blockade um, under the pretense of a, an arms embargo. And I think the Biden administration should also unentangle itself from the Saudi and Emirati regimes. You know, Biden called MBS, um, you know, rogue uh, during the campaign trail, but now seems to be committed to the protection of Saudi sovereignty, like he mentioned in the speech. And um, I also think that the U.S. should be committed to reparations. And Abdul Wasi mentioned all of the ways that the U.S. can be involved in that. Um, but, you know, not as charity. This isn't, you know, charity that we're asking for. We're asking for the right of Yemeni civilians to be compensated for the damage that has been done to them. Um, and, you know, how can you put a, a cost on somebody's life? You can't, but the very least you could do is to try to repair some of the damage that the U.S. has been involved in over the last six years. And I want to mention also that currently there's a um, a letter out uh, by representatives Dingle and, and Pokan and Kana. Um, you know, they're seeking congressional signers. Uh, I'm sure you're going to mention that later uh, for a letter urging the Biden administration to um, end the U.S. backed blockade. And I really encourage folks to reach out to their representatives and urge them to sign it. You know, there's a lot we can control with our own government here. There's not much we can control in Yemen. The road to peace is going to be a very um, difficult one for Yemenis, but I hope it's one that Yemenis can sort out on their own without foreign intervention. And um, here in the US, we can at least attempt to continue to pressure our government to end its own intervention in Yemen. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Shireen. Um, you know, I really appreciate your remarks and all of your work over the years. And I think you've set a wonderful foundation for what many of our activists are asking about in the chat and in previous submitted questions. So. Um, and, you know, I think I could talk about accountability for what's gone on for hours. So let's jump into questions. Um, and I'm sure a lot more will come up. Um, so we have a question um, from Marika that I think is a really great question that I want to get um, Abdul Wasab, anyone else who wants to answer. And I'll, I'll offer a couple questions so we can take them in batches and make sure we answer as many as possible. But um, Marika was asking about you know, we're talking about the like immediate humanitarian impacts of the war, but what about those ripple effects um, and those second order effects that happen when countries are in conflict so long? So one of the um, mention is like um, the issue of child marriage um, and how the war has impacted um, the rise of child marriage in Yemen. Um, I think the other question, um, and Shireen, you might be the one most interested in answering this, given your work um, in working with the US government advocating for an end to this assistance is, what's your sense of if Biden will actually end the sales um, to Saudi Arabia and the UAE, which is what Randy is asking. Um, and as you were talking about, what's your sense um, that like Congress could step in if he decides not to? Um, and then finally, I'll do three questions. Um, I want to say you talked about a lot of great, urgent, um, specific measures that the U.S. can take to really de-escalate the conflict, which is so important. Um, do you see a connection um, to international parties um, and the international community at the UN talking about accountability and potentially being used as like a lever to push for de-escalation just in terms of if there's a, a true commitment to accountability internationally for all parties to the conflict, do we think that would maybe bring more parties to the table at this point? Sama, I know you might have thoughts on that too. We can popcorn around to anyone who wants to jump in first. Yeah, hi, but I, I may go first if uh, others don't mind. So yeah, I just I just want to first to uh, uh, answer to the question about the uh, uh, negative uh, strategies that people or, or this conflict may have uh, forced people to go through. 
Uh, well, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, uh, the uh, economy is one barrier to, to people's survival uh, around. I mentioned that uh, over 50% of the families in Yemen have lost their livelihoods and the people have been devastated, devastated by this conflict across the country. They, they, they really struggle on, 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 on daily basis to provide for their children and the people's you know, most fear is is, is to get ill, you know, because they, they don't have the means to uh, visit the, or, or, or seek medical care. Uh, they, they, they don't really bear the, the, the costs. And uh, we have been witnessing uh, a lot of uh, negative coping mechanisms on, on uh, over the past six years. We have seen people, you know, cutting their meals because, uh, you know, to, to ensure that their little ones have enough to eat. Uh, and this explains, you know, the levels uh, or the, the high rates of malnourishment uh, uh, across the country and the, the, uh, uh, the, the highest also uh, food insecurity rate uh, on, on a global level, uh, which is in Yemen. And uh, uh, sadly, we also have seen cases or have been witnessing cases of of uh, uh, child marriage, uh, which is, you know, people uh, have, have been, you know, adapting uh, negatively because of, of their uh, uh, desperate, you know, measures, which because people, they don't really have uh, enough to eat. They don't have enough also protection, you know, to, to provide for their uh, girls. And also uh, this, you know, child marriage is, is not something new, but the, the the conflict has uh, further pushed rates of, of marriage uh, across the, the, the country. Um, now, um, I, I, want to, uh, I want to answer the, the second question, but I, uh, I don't know if others want also to uh, further comment on this one. Sure, Sama, Shireen, if you wanna um, jump in, but um, Abdul, what's that? Why don't you finish off if you just have something quick to add? If you want to finish quickly, Abdul Asa, that's totally fine too. Uh, all right, yeah. Uh, uh, could you just repeat the second question, Kate? Sorry about that. Sure. Um, so I asked a flurry of questions, so it's totally fine that you didn't remember them. Um, but the second question was just about, um, I think, like, is there is there a connection between accountability and de-escalating the war? Could true investment or commitment publicly by the international community to accountability for what's gone on over the last seven years actually help bring parties to the table who don't want to negotiate right now? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, because my internet is not that stable and sometimes I have breakups. So yeah. Uh, I think accountability is, is uh, a, a key uh, factor, you know, to bring the, the conflicting parties to the table because we have seen now over the past six years uh, that uh, conflicting par parties have uh, been, uh, you know, committing uh, uh, grave violations, uh, in, uh, you know, on, on different levels. Uh, but these violations, you know, have been ha have not been uh, uh, accounted to. Had uh, all. Uh, to the conflict have been uh, not uh, been have not been uh, uh, held accountable to any of their actions, and you know this uh, has left them room, you know, to commit more actions uh, and and violations across the country. I think it is uh, extremely important, you know, that the the the, uh, the international community uh, pushes for the adherence, you know, by all parties to the international humanitarian rights. Uh, or the international humanitarian law be, uh, to uh, you know to uh, ensure that civilians are are protected uh, all over the country thanks thanks so much Shireen. sama um i maybe some of you want to have something to add to this and i can answer the question later about the C congress and its role um so I don't have much to add on the humanitarian long-term effects. I think uh, the short-term effects are quite dire that they kind of uh, triple the effects of the long-term uh, subjects that we're talking about. And I think that the answer that you provided was just right on point. Um, I do have something to add about accountability and potentially what we would consider transitional justice in the upcoming phase. 
uh, I want to remind people that in 2012, Yemen entered through uh, a transitional phase where President Abdurrahman Mansour had been supposed to rule for two years while a process known as the National Dialogue Conference was taking place. And in the National Dialogue Conference, 565 uh, Yemenis came together to talk about what needs to be fixed in Yemen. That process was uh, flawed and it had many uh, issues with the structure of it. However, there was a committee dedicated to transitional justice uh, and national reconciliation. And so when we look at Yemen, we already have the basis of that work that we don't have to dig that far in. And I remember personally visiting that committee and having interviews with several members of the National Dialogue where these individuals talked about how far back they wanna go for transitional justice in Yemen, because it's, it's really, the history of Yemen was quite uh, tense and bloody. And so there were different incidents in the past where you know, people are still waiting uh, for that justice to be present. And so in a sense, we can build on that, on these discussions, on the outcomes that they have found, but the war completely changed that because now you have new players, new actors, you have regional uh, forces that are very much involved in Yemeni uh, politics, not as, as light as before, because also in the past they were involved, but not as heavily involved as we see today. And I think sometimes when we talk about accountability uh, and transitional justice, we, at least in political science, worry that too much accountability might ruin a potential peace process. Um, and so there needs to be a delicate balance where I think the most important thing to me before justice is the restoration of the dignity to the Yemeni people. And that has to happen with very basic steps, providing security, providing electricity, providing water, um, helping people access better health care, uh, pretty much the basis of any kind of justice or accountability in Yemen has to build on development and processes that restore people's dignity before we proceed forward. Um, thank you, Abdul Basa and Sama. I really uh, appreciate those insights and, and agree fully, you know, there's so much uh, within Yemen here and uh, a foreign intervention has kind of pushed all of these um, advances, you know, toward peace aside. Um, but also to answer the question about Congress and whether we think that um, the Biden administration is going to be moved here to end weapon sales or not, and to engage in Yemen in a positive way. Um, you know, Biden said he was going to end um, offensive support for the offensive operations in Yemen. For me, this is concerning because Obama's entry to the war back in 2015 frame this as an as a defensive operation and here we are six years later with you know nothing about this is defensive um all of the civilians killed have been yemeni um but i think that you know to frame it as a defensive operation is problematic and then biden also said that he was going to review um you know relevant arms sales to the saudis and the emiratis so i think what needs to happen is that all arms sales needs need to be uh, you know stopped if this is a good faith effort by the biden administration you know um, they did restore aid. They did um, undo some of the harms of the Trump administration, like the FTO designation, for example. Um, but you know, there's still the the blockade is still U.S. backed. The um, you know fighting is still U.S. backed. There are some weapons, many weapons that are still being sold to the Saudis and the Emiratis. There's still training. There you know Saudi air forces and the U.S. air forces are still training together in Saudi Arabia. We're still helping them with the maintenance and repair of vehicles and aircraft. So facilitating this war in many, many, many ways. So I think what needs to happen is for Congress to ensure that this ends in all of its forms. Another War Powers Act would be fantastic, um, but you know I'm, I'm sensing that this is not where they wanna go. Um, the current letter that's out right now is not a bill, it's a letter. It's a letter urging Biden to you know, uh, lift the blockade unconditionally on humanitarian grounds as David Beasley of the World Food Program has urged. Um, and so I think it's important for, for Biden to, uh, you know, if he says that he wants to end the war, he should end US support for the war fully. Um, and then pressure the allies as well. 
Thank you so much, Shireen, and everyone for their comments. Uh, you know, I I personally could continue to have this conversation for hours because there's so much to unpack and so many amazing creative solutions that our government just has not been thinking about over these last six, seven years. And um, the way it's gone about um, its Yemen policy for decades has been not helpful um, and destructive in a lot of ways. And so I, for one, am hopeful that, um, you know, continued organizing here in the U.S. can continue to push the U.S. in the right direction to actually become the quote unquote peacemaker that um, pre the president has said he wants the U.S. to be. Um, now, I know that uh, there are some internet connectivity issues and our speaker schedules are totally packed. So I just wanted to pause here. Um, we are going to turn next to how Win Without War wants activists to press for the US to play a positive role for peace and justice. But I first just wanted to thank our speakers um, for being here with us today um, and sharing their thoughts and visions for a new way forward in Yemen towards sustainable peace and tangible justice. I know that some of our speakers need to drop off. So please join me in thanking them um, if they do. And if they can stay on, then great. But thank you all for being and sh sharing your thoughts today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. So um, now I want to talk about a little bit about what um, our viewers are here to learn about in terms of what they can do to possibly impact US policy in Yemen. Um, so what you'll see in the chat um, is links to a couple different actions that you can take. Um, one is a petition that calls on President Biden to permanently ban weapon sales to Saudi Arabia and the UAE as the first step towards creating accountability in US policy. So as we were discussing, um, the Biden administration did put a pause on weapon sales in February, which was a huge victory for activists who've been organizing for this for years, but as Shireen noted, um, they haven't been transparent about what that means, how long that ban lasts, what weapons are covered by these offensive defensive opera uh, operations definitions. And so that's why we want you all to take action and sign this petition so we can show um, unequivocally that the US public wants the president to be bold and make his pause permanent. The second action um, that we're launching today um, is a letter to the editor tool on Yemen. Um, so you can all easily submit letters to the editors of your local newspapers about how President Biden can fulfill his campaign promises on Yemen. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over now to my teammate, Amisha, who's going to briefly walk us through the Win Without War letter to the editor tool. Amisha, over to you. Thank you, Kate. Hi everyone, my name is Amisha and I'm the policy associate at Win Without War. So, you know, our team is working every day to show decision makers in Congress that there are real alternatives to our destructive military first policies in Yemen that we've heard about throughout this webinar. But we need your power behind this work. We need activists like yourselves to put pressure on the government to actually choose these alternatives and to put pressure on the media to cover this issue and show that choosing peace is, is a viable option. So as Kate mentioned, there are two ways that you can take action with us today. So the first is the petition, which is linked down in the chat and it's also on our website. And the second is this um, using this letter to the editor tool. So. You can also find that on our website under the Take Action tab. It's going to be in the chat. And then we'll also send it out by email after the webinar. So writing a letter to the editor, whether it's to your local paper or to the national newspaper, is a really impactful way to send a high visibility message. It's one of the most frequently read sections of the newspaper. And also like members of their Congress, members of Congress and their staff, like they wanna know what their constituents are saying about them. So I'm going to walk you through this really amazing tool that we have that helps you write and submit the letters very easily. So I'm going to share my screen. All right, so this is what our tool looks like. 
So the first step you are going to take is on the right hand side here, you can fill in your contact information. And what this does is it will pull up the newspapers in your area. So for example, if I put in this information for Win Without War and click Submit, here it's pulled up a list of national newspapers and then also regional newspapers for the DC area. And you can choose to submit to as, as many or as few as you'd like. Now, to actually write your letter, if you come down to the left-hand side here, we have some talking points and you can copy and paste these. Um, and this is just really to provide some really critical background information and context on the conflict. Next, we have a few writing tips. So the most important thing is make your letter personal. Editors want to hear from you and so do readers in your area. You know, why do you care about ending our destructive policies and why should other people care? So make it personal and also keep it short. Letters to the editor are typically 150 to 250 words. So keep it as concise as possible. And finally, we have a sample text here that you can use if you wish. So I'm going to copy this text. And then if I scroll back up to the newspapers, let's say I want to submit to the Baltimore Sun, I click select. I can just paste the message in here. I can edit it, personalize it, add a subject line, and then I just click submit. And if, you, if your letter is selected, then you would get an email back to the contact information that you provided. So once again, you can find this tool and the letter on our website under the Take Action tab. And I really hope you'll make use of it because it's a really amazing tool. And you, know, you may not think that you can do that much individually, but this is how we build momentum when we put our voices together. Um, you know, this is how we build the people power that we need to actually make peace, accountability, and justice a viable part of our policy on Yemen. So with that, I will pass it back to Kate to wrap up. Thanks so much, Amisha. And as we close, I want to thank again our amazing speakers for joining us today, including Shireen, who stayed along with us, for Amisha, Alice, and Amy, and the rest of the team at Win Without War, and to all of you for being here and for your dedicated activism to help the people in Yemen and end our government's harmful role in the country. Don't forget to click the links in the chat or go to winwithoutwar.org to take action with us today. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.